goal of mediation. For parties, they are infinite. On the surface, perhaps it is to settle a commercial dispute and avoid litigation, arrange custody, or contact with children as part of a divorce settlement. It could be working towards solving a performance issue between departments in an organization, or between neighbors, where loud music keeps another awake at night. The permutations are endless. Whatever the grievance, parties will always be the experts on themselves and their situations. The conflict is their lived experience. So our role as mediators is to create spaces where people feel safe and secure and willing to share their interests and ultimately their needs. Skilled facilitation by a mediator helps parties discover ways through the discord towards a more stable, peaceful place. Let's recall the Austrian psychologist we mentioned in the beginning of this module, when he posited that humans cannot not communicate. What does this mean for us in our role as neutral facilitators? The purpose of exploring our inner leanings and various cultural dimensions that are at play is to broaden our horizons and open our minds. In doing so, we learn of our partiality and how our lived experiences and cultural histories impact upon the mediation process. Where are our mediator blind spots? With consideration for our discussions on culture in this module thus far, this next section will investigate communication for consideration for how we can increase our impact as culturally sensitive mediators. Together we will use our curiosity to consider rapport, listening, cues and triggers. I'd like to begin this section with a short exercise from Coaching for Performance by Sir John Whitmore. Please pause the module as you, quote, Recall someone you loved being with when you were younger. Not a parent, perhaps a grandparent, a teacher or role model. When you were with this person, what did they do that you liked so much? How did you feel? Think about the person's attitudes and behaviors and write down your answers. I'd encourage you to spend about 10 minutes on this. This exercise connects our experiences of positive communication with the emotional intelligence of the person we remember loving to spend time with. Whitmore has found that people all over the world express similar responses to these questions. Here are some of the answers that he records. The person listened to me, believed in me, challenged me, trusted and respected me, gave me their time and full attention, treated me as an equal. How did people feel? People felt special, valued, confident, safe and cared for. They felt supported and a sense of fun and enthusiasm at being with this person. And it increased their self-belief. Pause the module to look at your list. Where are their similarities? What do you notice? What comes up as you reflect on your mediation practice? In their powerful book, Rapport, The Four Ways to Read People, psychologists Allison and Allison share their scientific findings of how to build rapport based on many years of engaging criminals, terrorists, young offenders, and professionals within the justice system. They identify four pillars of establishing rapport with their HERE acronym. The H stands for honesty, the E stands for empathy, A for autonomy, and R for reflection. Let's take a closer look at what they're really meaning. Honesty, to be objective and direct when communicating your intention or feelings. Empathy, is understanding someone based on recognition of their core values and beliefs. I link this to Marshall Rosenberg's seminal book on nonviolent communication. 
He says, quote, the key ingredient of empathy is presence, when we are wholly present with the other party and what they are experiencing. This quality of presence distinguishes empathy from either mental understanding or sympathy, end quote. As we consider what it means to be present, we must be aware of our body language in these moments. How are we showing people that we are hearing them? What are we communicating non-verbally? Are we leaning in, mirroring their posture? What level of eye contact are we making? There is actually so much going on within ourselves and our surrounding environment. And because of this, our self-awareness is all the more essential. The A in the HERE acronym is for autonomy. Emphasize other people's free will and right to choose when to cooperate. When reading of this aspect, I was reminded of Viktor Frankl, an Austrian neurologist, philosopher, and Holocaust survivor. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, he says, quote, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way, end quote. Freedom of choice to settle a dispute and how to do so is fundamental for parties in any mediation. The autonomous nature of the process is the essence of what makes mediation a dynamic and bespoke experience for parties. We see this idea of freedom of choice highlighted by many psychologists and theorists. The R stands for reflection. Identify and repeat back those elements that are significant, meaningful, and tactical to help guide a conversation towards a goal. Reflecting back to parties gives them an opportunity to say more about the key words or phrases you've reflected back, or to perhaps correct themselves and introduce a new sentiment or idea, or offer some clarity. Allison and Allison remind us of the power of affirmation in our reflections. When we pick up on language linked to possibility and hone in on this, the focus can shift to a more creative place, where parties can harness their creativity brainstorming, and generation of options. This can involve the simple repetition of a single word, frustration, forgiveness, to name a couple. Building rapport begins the second we make contact with parties to a mediation. An initial pre-mediation phone call or email, the language and wording we choose, our tone, pitch, pace, or the gaze we hold as we welcome parties into the room invite them to sit or offer them a refreshment. Now that we are more aware of our cultural histories and the cultures around us, we need to pause and really think about the role we play as facilitators of communication in a mediation process. Part of establishing rapport is considering how we can meet parties' expectations. Whether parties attend as individuals or arrive accompanied by advocates, it is our responsibility to set the stage and ensure everyone is prepared for what is to come. Communicating the structure of a mediation and equally the bespoke and flexible nature of the process manages the element of surprise and helps get parties into the right frame of mind. I often ask how people arrive in the beginning of a mediation because we can never know from one session to the next, what has transpired in a person's life. This kind of offering makes it clear that we as mediators are never making assumptions. We give parties an opportunity to bring the group up to speed. And I can share an example of this from a case I had last year. It took place over several evenings. And one evening, one party arrived looking visibly unwell. My co-mediator and I began with the simple question of how are you doing in this moment? She shared that she was fighting a cold, slept terribly the night before, and her, had received some difficult news concerning a member of her family earlier in the week. Naturally, our first question was whether she would prefer to postpone the mediation session. She declined, and this allowed us to ask whether there was a particular agenda item that might feel more manageable for her to deal with today. As a co-mediation team, we modeled empathy 
whilst respecting her autonomy. Her partner softened the other party and was able to show her compassion. He was agreeable and respectful to follow her lead on the agenda and so the session unfolded. Most basic mediation trainings introduce the concept of active listening, a way of listening which lets the speaker know that they have been heard, often by paraphrasing their original statement back to them in some form. Active listening is an important part of any mediator's toolkit. And in this section, I would like for us to go a little bit deeper. Think back to the person you remembered in our last exercise. How did you know they were listening to you? Perhaps there were physical signals that let you know this person was paying attention. Eye contact, the gentle nodding of a head, or simple verbal acknowledgements such as, mm, mm hmm, or yes. When we reflect on what is happening inside us as we listen, we become aware of the depth of our listening. Consider this common distraction as a speaker's mobile phone rings in the middle of a sentence. This kind of interruption challenges the listener to stay with the speaker and keep their focus. Naturally, how the speaker responds to this distraction has an influence as well. However, we may become in these moments aware of the dialogue in our own heads. Kimsey House, Kimsey House, Sandal and Whitworth refer to this as level one or internal listening. Those thoughts that pass through our minds whilst we're listening to someone, like, will we be on time to collect our kids from school? Did I miss my dentist appointment? It's raining and I forgot my umbrella. This kind of listening helps us navigate our environments and serves a valuable purpose. However, it's important when we're working with parties to consider limiting this first level as we try to dive deeper into the process and understand the interests and the needs of parties to a mediation. Level two, or focus listening, requires the listener to turn off his or her internal dialogue and really focus on the listener. For example, the mediator might notice one word that's emerged several times in the conversation, and it might go something like this. You mentioned frustration at the beginning of our session, and I've heard you mention it two times since. Can you say a little bit more about what frustration means for you? And so the idea is that we're drilling down to better understand the needs of the party. Level three listening is referred to as global listening and involves tapping into our intuitive senses. When listening is reached at this level, there's a feeling of flow in the conversation and layers of meaning are nuanced. Over time, mediators hone their intuition, which helps them choose when to seek clarity from a party, when and which questions to ask or which words to reflect back. Listening at this level requires a person to be fluid and adaptable as they follow the speaker. In mediation, sometimes we see this at the option generating phase or when brainstorming ideas are being captured without prejudice, conveying a sense of possibility to the parties. A further point on intuition, which is difficult to teach and yet requires our acknowledgement. Intuition offers validation to the energy in our bodies and what we notice in our environment. Hunches. What I noticed you said was, is something missing? Being aware of the energies in our body and the energy in the room. Another aspect of listening comes from the way we articulate what we observe. Noticing and naming a party's emotions, checking whether this is an accurate reflection, and if not, inviting the party to provide clarity. This can deepen the level of discussion and naturally invites parties to connect with what is happening for them in their hearts, bodies, and minds. In considering self-awareness, we need to think through how we know when we are moving from observation to interpretation, Hofstede said. None of us is meant to be experts on all cultures and customs, and when in doubt, ask, never assume. In my experience, genuine curiosity is nearly always met with a favorable response. I can recall an example from my time as a young mediator in London, where I worked with a very marginalized and vulnerable community group. My having come from abroad was actually a great asset 
because nobody could plot my accent on any socioeconomic lines. And I was able to ask for people's context in a really meaningful way because I genuinely didn't come from there and didn't understand the nuance. This kind of example is a great way of considering your own personal experience from mediation where you've been able to seek to understand another person in an authentic way. In this model, we have explored how we evolve as humans, making sense of the world through our lived environments. From our earliest years, we make assumptions and generalizations to learn all sorts of things. Let's take the example of a small child who has had a bad experience with a Dalmatian dog who leapt up and knocked her over. This child may stereotype all dogs as dangerous and develop an unfavorable response when she comes in contact with any dog. This is a subconscious way of protecting herself in future. And I think we can all agree that some hesitation on the part of the child the next time she meets a dog would be sensible. So where does this stereotyping go wrong? Well, when people begin to assign traits and behaviors to groups of people, which does not account for the individual or their situation, we risk interpreting rather than observing. Though Hofstede's cultural dimensions can be very useful for us as practitioners, it is important to reiterate once again the diversity that exists, exists within cultures and across them. Have you noticed what happens to your body in high conflict situations? Remember the limbic system we discussed earlier? When we feel threatened, stressed, anxious, or angry, the system is triggered and our fight or flight response can be set off. The amygdala is the part of our brains that activates this response. And by releasing stress hormones into the body, adrenaline flows, which prepares us for us to run or stand and take on the stimulus. And in high stress situations, this can overpower our frontal cortex, which is the part of our brain responsible for our logical thinking. Much of the mediation I have done, whether working with families or in organizations, finds conflict to be highly escalated. We need to be aware of our own triggers and find ways to manage these to be effective in our role as mediators. When our amygdala is triggered, our body sends signals to quicken our breathing, or perhaps you can feel your pulse beating in your body. Keeping calm helps us stay effective in our roles, and the following tips may be useful. Meditating on a regular basis has a compound effect on our sense of peace, calm, and well-being, as does practicing mindfulness. In the moment, breathe deeply and slow down your breath. Like meditation where we can train ourselves, the mind responds to ritual and symbol. And a tool I've added to my kit whilst working virtually is to place a drop or two of an essential oil on a tissue, which I can breathe in when I feel a need for calm or to return my attention to the present. You may have other tips in your toolkit that you can resource yourself with. Communicating calmly and with intention is another tip for you. This form of modeling by a mediator can help the parties to slow down as well. The philosopher I mentioned earlier, Viktor Frankl, had another wonderful quote when he said that between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And our response lies our growth and our freedom." End quote. Another option you have is to take a break. It always remains op open to you, and sometimes everyone needs a pause to collect themselves and reflect on where they're at and where the process is going. So in summary, we must be mindful, meditate, breathe, and take a break. When mediators treat parties with equal respect and dignity, we hear them and model positive communication. When we listen actively and use a party's own words to reflect back, we are showing them that we have listened. When we ask questions in the spirit of genuine inquiry, we are seeking to understand a party on a deeper level. When we notice our values and belief systems challenged, we do not have to agree, but we do need to try and understand the other. When we uphold confidentiality, we are communicating our commitment to the process 
and exhibiting professionalism in the field. When a party wishes to leave a mediation, we seek first to understand whilst respecting their autonomy to do so. Thank you for joining me in this module exploring culture and communication as it relates to our role as mediators. I hope your reflections will prove useful to you in your work going forward. For me, our learning reminds me that being a mediator requires a high degree of adaptability, self-awareness and respect for others. Our authentic cur curiosity guides us in our work and helps us and parties to connect to their interests and needs. References and resources for this module will follow and provide a rich pool of knowledge to further support your growth. Thank you.